Yeah, yeah. yeah Nidaji, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay, fine. Anup, live kar do isko. लाइव कर दिया ठीक है घर के आर नॉट सीइंग आई वी ही इज देयर सर ही इज देयर या ही इज देयर आई थिंक ऑलमोस्ट ऑल ओके ओके सो गुड आफ्टरनून लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन एमिनेंट स्पीकर्स टू दिस वंडरफुल वेबिनार of uh, role of atmanirbhar bharat role of higher education institutions on this uh, monday afternoon i welcome you all myself neeraj aroda senior director and head sochm national council on education so i behalf of uh, uh, sochm welcome you all to this uh, wonderful webinar today we have a uh, we have very eminent speakers with us starting from uh, professor kk agrawal ji who is the chairman of national board of accreditation we have dr abhay jiri chief uh, innovation officer mhrd dr anita gupta head nstdb dst dr ak garg scientist f ministry of electronics and information technology government of india dr gd sharma former secretary ugc dr a garg director kite group of institution mr raghav gupta md india apsc coursera Mr. Sapnil Jain, CEO Orai Robotics; Dr. Preeti Chitkara, Manager IA Kite Group of Institution. So again, uh, I Nira Jaroda, Senior Director and Head, SOCM National Council on Education, on behalf of Education, welcome you all to this wonderful webinar, Atmanirbhar Bharat: Role of Higher Education Institutions. Now uh, I would request uh, Dr. A Garg, Director Kite Group of Institutions, for the welcome address and set the tone, sir. Dr. A. K. Garg yeah, has completed his uh, sir. Uh, Dr. A. K. Garg completed his uh, B. E. in mechanical engineering from Delhi College of Engineering in 1986, and joined the Indian Army. While in service, he completed his M. Tech in Industry, Tribology, and uh, Maintenance Engineering from IIT Delhi in 1996, and subsequently successfully defended his uh, thesis on multi echelon repair. inventory system from department of mechanical engineering iit delhi in 2010 he also has a post graduate diploma in computer application which he obtained in 2004 he has his credit some highly cited publications and is a recipient of emerald literacy network 2012 award for excellence for best paper dr a garg was also director of sikkim manipal institution of technology under sikkim manipal university for a period of 2 years before joining kite group of institution in march 2018 his areas of expertise includes industrial engineering maintenance management operation management and supply chain management dr ak garg would request you for the welcome address and setting the tone sir over to you sir yeah yeah thank you thank you neeraj thank you very much uh, honorable chief guest shri kk agarwal ji chairman nba all eminent panelists and participants from all across india good afternoon to all of you and a warm welcome to this webinar on atmanirbhar bharat role of higher education institutions now let us first quickly uh, see what actually we mean by self reliant india or atmanirbhar bharat to my mind there are five pillars to that what we as a country are looking forward to is a quantum jump in economy improvement in the infrastructure that represents modern india technology driven systems to meet 21st century aspirations or the dreams of the country vibrant demography of the young workforce and the utilization of demand and supply cycle to the full capacity now these are the five pillars around which the self reliant india would definitely depend on and lie on now all this can be facilitated by the students and that is where the role of higher education institutions is of paramount importance it can be achieved by the institution through cross skilling upskilling reskilling or export skilling of the students and by by the higher education institutions and that is where the role of the higher education institutions to make india self reliant is extremely extremely critical and important 
now to to give you the overall picture uh, i mean and, and just to uh, remind you of uh, you know the kind of a uh, numbers we have and the kind of a uh, challenges we have i'll just quickly quote uh, that uh, there are about 950 universities in the country 40000 colleges in which we have approximately 3.75 cr students with 14 lakh teachers this is the total arena of the higher education and the aict vice chairman during one of his recent addresses he meant he mentioned that there are 28 lakh seats for engineering in india out of which 14 to 15 lakhs on an average they get filled up every year and out of that 7 lakh students once they pass out 14 lakh once they pass out only 7 lakhs of lakh students they get employed and the balance they do not get employed and they we we call we can call them educated unemployed now which is quite worrisome 50% of the students as a national average you know that figure percentage may be you know slightly uh, you know may vary uh, uh, and as per the actuals but this percentage anything which is about 40 to 50% it is very worrisome figure and which i feel to my in my opinion is a major roadblock for atmanirbhar bharat now what can be done uh, to to face this kind of a challenge and more challenges what can be done by the higher education institutions and for higher education institutions uh, the various stakeholders what can they do for you uh, that we will just see it shortly and we have to find the answer how we can overcome these issues uh, so that uh, as a, as a major stakeholder in the entire journey of the country higher education institutions have got a major contribution now there are few points uh, to my mind uh, which uh, we need to introspect the first is in the country more or less in all the institutions once i say more or less all the institutions i say that all the tier 2 and tier 3 institutions you know where where the average students of, of the country they study Now the teaching process need to have a major change in the country. Now what we need to have is more focus should be towards solving industry or society or the real life problems. And there should be a 25% only in the classroom teaching and 75% of the time by the student should be spent on the problem solving of the industry or the society and, and it should be a research based learning. While what we have in the country as of now we all see that there is a 90% classroom teaching and 10% is a practical exposure only so aict very recently in the internship policy a very beautiful policy uh, they have rolled out and they made a honest effort and instructions have gone already to all the universities that 750 hours of internship should be there for all the students this can be during the semester it can be during the vacations but the policy has been issued but what we are finding that there is a, there is a gap there is still a lot of gap industry is still not ready uh, to 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 accept such large number of students uh, as as uh, as the, as, the, as the interns so both sides need to work hard on that and that is one gap which i feel is a impediment for 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 the uh, for the art bharat uh, india now another thing which i find uh, very very glaring is the industry academia integration is not there proper as i mentioned in the aict internship policy this integration should become mandatory in fact uh, we must uh, have the autonomy given to the professors they must be in a position to decide their own courses the centers of excellence what we have in the institutions various institutions we find those centers of excellence are limited only to the work within the institutions while these centers of excellence should be for the industry industry should find those center of excellence useful for them and professors which are there in the centers of excellence they should be in the board of companies and similarly the industry people the industry director they should be in the board of governors of the colleges and they both sides should have a decisive role both sides should find that there is a, there is a benefit to each other in in in, in collating and in kind of a coordinating with each other so this is what probably needs to be done immediately by 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 all the academic institutions and the industry another thing which i find the quality of labs what we compare the quality of labs more or less all of us have got as per the university syllabus but what we need is that the lab should be as per the industry requirement and they should act as the centers of excellence for the industry which can meet their needs so once we have this kind of a setup then everything will come out of that you know publications patents everything when the industry finds that the academia is going to make use of them their the academia is of use to them then definitely this kind of a lot of improvements in terms of the publications and everything everything will come another important aspect is about the quality of faculty and the number of faculty now we all know that uh, you know uh, the teaching is still not a preferred career option in india uh, we we don't find and and i say that the institutions uh, are to uh, invest in the faculty in addition to investment in the infrastructure you find there is a huge infrastructure but then you find the quality of faculty is not very good 
no, it's like something you know you have got a beautiful mobile the latest mobile but then you don't have a sim in that in terms of the quality faculty so that 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 uh, mobile is of no use unless there is a sim so that infrastructure is of no use unless you have a, a proper qualified motivated faculty so mindset needs to change in this direction and that is where we need to work uh, in the in this particular uh, area uh, for for a major contribution by the hiis uh, to make the india self reliant also if i come to uh, the quality of education we find that there is no participatory education or very limited participatory education the way we teach now i would like to mention that during the recent pandemic uh, we found uh, found a beautiful experience in terms of the online courses like uh, we we had a large number of students they had access to various online courses and and ptl we were already doing but then one of the courses i would like to mention the coursera for example Uh, in our university we found that a large number of students have taken the course of courses and it is a participatory education any course you do you find that in every lecture twice or thrice uh, there are questions which are prompted to you and then you are made to do the assignments and then finally you you come out of this exercise uh, after 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 having a satisfaction of a quality learning With the, with the participation of the student, equal participation of the student as of the faculty. So this kind of a culture, this kind of a mindset, uh, which need to come uh, to the higher education institutions. Similarly, I find that we need to prepare students for the skills of tomorrow. Now, artificial intelligence, machine learning, IoT, additive manufacturing, robotics, blockchain, uh, then uh, life skills in terms of the soft skills and the creative thinking, augmented reality. All these things is not possible to cover in in the syllabus from nine to five. what can be done is that the learning what we have had during the last uh, four months uh, during this pandemic we need to quickly migrate to the blended learning and and we need to create a specializations like for example coursera courses coursera courses there are large number of courses if you do those courses in a span of say about four semesters that may lead to a specialization a minor specialization and that is what the country needs and that is what we need we can after the second year when the students get into the third year thereafter we can lay a road map for the minor specialization those minor specialization can be from within the institution resources or it could also be from the external agencies like coursera and other online platform so this is what needs to be done and we need to quickly migrate to it all these learnings which we have done in last four months when the college is open when the lockdown lifts then it is the responsibility of each one of us that whatever beautiful experience we have had of the blended learning that should not be allowed to fade away and we must quickly take decisions to ensure that these kind of road maps in terms of the specialized learning for the for the skills for tomorrow we put them into a system in our, in our system at the earliest this is what the probably is need of the hour and associated with this is the digital infrastructure and, and the digital learning road map all the institutions you know in in the initially in the month of march they resorted to online teaching but then you feel lot of them feel that there is a, a lot of digital infrastructure which is required to be improved with the institution so all that probably need to be done immediately and i'm sure uh, this would be one of the takeaways for for this particular uh, discussion now associated with this i find that uh, the major roadblock for for more contribution by the hiis uh, to to the country is a probably limitations in terms of the consultancy you know very very few institutions barring the iits and iisc you know at year two institution they hardly have any consultancy to contribute to, to the industry number of patents publications all those are very less and i had a franking list which i had seen barring the top 50 institutions you know 51 onward you find that the number of publications really less because as i mentioned the number of faculty needs to increase the culture has to be there we need to uh, devise some novel means in the institutions where probably depending on the aptitude of a faculty we can earmark some faculty as a research faculty no they want they would like to do the research and accordingly their teaching load can be reduced there can be incentive for patents there can be incentive for publications so these things we need to work and we need to work along with the industry as i said unless we make our our necessity felt by the industry all these things will not happen let industry feel yes their problem can be solved by the institutions by the centers of excellence once they do that then all these consultancy consultancy patents and publications will automatically flow um, i also would like to mention about the entrepreneurship and innovation is again a very very important thing uh, i think in all the institutions other than the placement and higher education thrust we must create another third vertical in the institutions of the entrepreneurship 
right from the day one from the year one till year four as far as the engineering is concerned the student must be given a road map and once he comes out of the college or maybe by third year he should be in a position to publish a patent and his final year project should be around 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 that area in which he wants to start his own company and and let 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 20 to 30 percent students you know maybe after five years we can plan that you know 20 percent students passing out from the colleges they should be in a position to start their own company and that is the way we can we, we can address the issue of the non-employment of the country also because no government job no private sector alone can give so many jobs to the country so this is what is required to be done and i'm sure the innovation and intern and entrepreneurship is the need of the hour and all the education institutions have got the where with us but but we need to have a will and we need to create a proper roadmap for implementation by the students uh, lastly what i would like to mention that another very important responsibility is i is about the unnat bharat abhiyan by the institutions like the events uh, the the schemes like prime minister kaushal vikas yojana uh, i feel that in most of the colleges the scheme is there of the government scheme but it is not very very successful you know you you we can take the responsibility the institutions can take on the responsibility and the eighth pass or 10th or 12th pass student from the adopted villages or maybe from the other side you know those 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 students can be brought to the college and the colleges can ensure that they are skilled and they are given the employment so this is uh, these are these are few things which can be done there are lot many things under the unnat uh, bharat abhiyan which can be done by the higher education institutions so this is uh, these are my views on 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 the issue and i'm sure uh the the kind of uh, eminent panel which we have here today they are going to throw more light and there is going to be a lot of discussion and finally there is going to be a lot of take away so thank you very much thank you very much and i'm sure with these contributions uh, we will be able to contribute very effectively as higher education institutions uh, towards the nation building uh, to make the india self reliant thank you very much thank you very much over to you neeraj thank you thank you dr garg uh, thank you so much for this wonderful and energetic uh, session of yours uh, definitely sir the whole idea of uh, conducting such webinars are to get the feedback from you people you belong to institution we have uh, eminent speakers from uh, government uh, departments also so after the program we will definitely make a recommendation paper white paper that we will submit to the mhrd and related government bodies so this is the sole aim of conducting such webinars and i agree with your point that uh, uh there should be a proper connect between industry and academia uh, we are talking about uh, this uh, since last many years but still there is some gap because what industries are expecting from uh, institutions i mean we are not uh, fulfilling that and what institutions are uh, uh, producing is not uh, usable by the by the industries and the second takeaway uh, from your uh, from your speech what i can uh, take is uh, that uh, definitely the institutions have worked very hard especially our faculties have worked very very hard in last 3 to 4 months to keep the education alive uh, you know uh, and the, i'm uh, definitely so we should uh, go with a blended approach a physical uh, uh, presence of the students in the classroom and as well as uh, you know the use of it so a blended approach should be there in taking forward the education system sir uh, thank you so much now we have uh, with us uh, mr raghav gupta yeah. who is the managing director of uh, india and apc coursera uh, yeah so uh, mr raghav uh, leads coursera in india and apac he is responsible for growing coursera's consumer and enterprise business in the region thereby uh, bringing the world's best education to learners across asia pacific raghav has 20 years of experience across consumer internet and management consulting industries in india south southeast asia and europe previously raga was a india country manager at blabla Bla car an intercity car pooling service as a management consultant for 15 years raga led the retail practice and of strategies in india and several as president of uh, technopark advisors raga holds an mba from insead in france he did his post graduation in fashion business management from the national institution of fashion technology in delhi over to you mr raga we would like to hear from you that how uh, you know online courses and online education are going to uh, take us towards satnirbhar bharat over to you mr raghav uh, please unmute yourself thank you neeraj uh, could you confirm that you can hear me yes all right i'd like to share my screen please if i could get uh, rights to that
I think it's showing if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, we can see your screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just make it uh, full screen. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, good afternoon to the other panelists and everyone who's joining. Uh, absolute pleasure to be here. I see uh, the meeting allows 1,001 people, and there are 1,001 people. So clearly, this is a topic which is you know important and of high interest. I'm going to talk a little bit about yes. how, uh, from a Coursera perspective, uh, we are undergoing digital transformation in higher education. Uh, COVID-19 is, of course, a key element of all of this and share some of what we are seeing at Coursera as well as some of the work that we've been doing over the last few months and quarters. Uh, so let me quickly start by sharing uh, what's been happening with jobs as well as higher education uh, in India as well as around the world. Um, at a headline level, you know, COVID-19 has disrupted jobs and has also accelerated need for technology in higher education. We are clearly seeing this because of many data points. Uh, the International Labour Organization tells us that because of the economic impact of COVID-19, uh, as many as 435 million jobs or almost 43.5 crore jobs are going to go away around the world. And from a higher education standpoint, I think students coming out of higher education in the next two, three years will possibly face the toughest job market that, they, that we have ever seen just because of the uh, economic impact of COVID-19. At the same time, a very large number of students are affected globally. In H1 first half of this year, uh, UNESCO tells us that 1.6 billion students have been impacted because of school closures. Uh, this is K-12 as well as higher education. And of this, about 200 million or 20 crore are students in higher education around the world. At the same time, we have seen a very massive increase in uh, usage of online education. And Dr. Garg also spoke about some of what they've been seeing at uh, uh, KIET. On the Coursera platform, in the months of March and April alone, uh, compared to 2019, we have seen a 644% increase in usage, so almost a 6.5x growth in uh, usage. And then very importantly, regulators, uh, whether it be in India or all around the world, are playing an important role and are increasingly encouraging the use of online learning for credit. And I've been a part of webinars and meetings where uh, AICT uh, chairman, UGC chairman, even secretary of higher education to MHRD have spoken about possibly increasing the 20% uh, usage of online for credit to 40%. So regulators are increasingly uh, moving along these lines. And we're seeing this in Malaysia, we're seeing this in Kazakhstan, other countries as well. Now, given some of the disruption that all of us saw when you know uh, COVID hit and lockdown started, our platform, Coursera's platform, which is Coursera for Campus, which is designed for colleges and universities uh, to use, uh, we made that available to, for free to any college or university from mid-March onwards. And this included about 3,800 courses and specializations, and these were made available uh, to colleges and universities around the world. And let me share with you a little bit of what we have seen in the last uh, few months. Uh, universities and colleges have responded very strongly. You know, around the world, across universities, 10,000 programs have been launched by Coursera. Uh, almost 1.3 million students or 13 lakh students are currently learning on our platform. And these 1.3 million students have taken 7.5 million courses and spent many, many millions of hours in uh, learning, almost 20 million plus hours. And uh, Dr. Gal's institution is one of these institutions. Uh, you know, this program is available still for the next few months. And, you know, almost one third of this program has been in India. So, uh, you know, uh, India has probably seen the largest usage and the largest adoption. All of this, of course, has happened because all the universities and companies who create content on Coursera have been very willing to support the disruption and you know mitigate the disruption that has happened. And all of this has been enabled for no charge and it's available for the next few months as well. Institutions like Symbiosis, uh, NITE in South India, many leading institutions, you know, amongst them IITs, IIMs, have also been benefiting from some of what we have made available. 
And with some of this as context, uh, in our conversations with uh, academic leaders, in our work with academic leaders, we are finding that these might be some key trends and challenges that we are likely to see in the future. Uh, blended classrooms in an, in an era where social distancing will continue for a while, which is both blending offline plus online, but also on campus because social distancing will not allow a full class to have some students in the class, but possibly some students online may continue to be the case and start to be the case for a while. Second, the adoption of online courses and the recognition of online credentials is likely to continue to grow. And I shared some statistics around what we have seen in the past. Thirdly, pressure on tuition fees and cash flows is very significant. It's not an easy time to be uh, a ed uh, higher education uh, institution leader at this point in time. And I would say online has a big role to play in this because companies like Oseva can bring a lot of efficiency in terms of delivering uh, education because as an online platform, the costs are much lower. And fourthly, and I spoke about this, the need for job relevant education for enabling students for career success was there always. But given that the next two, three years are going to be an extremely hard job market, this need has gone up many fold uh, because of what we have seen in the last few months. And with that in mind, uh, the way we've been working at Coursera is we've been par partnering with higher education institutions during crisis, during rapid change. But I would also say opportunity because many academic leaders have talked about bringing about change in higher education. And this crisis is an opportunity as well because we can do in one year what we could have possibly done in 10 years without a COVID-19 situation. And with that, let me quickly introduce some of what we've been thinking and what we've been doing as well. So this is the Coursera platform. Uh, Coursera is the world's largest higher education uh, company, and it comprises of three platforms, uh, uh, pillars, learners, educators, and institutions. A very large number of individuals come to our platform to learn, almost 65 million. Of this, uh, a very large number, 8 million or 80 lakh individuals are in India. These are working professionals. These are also students in higher education and uh, universities and colleges. What they learn comes from 200 universities and companies. These are top universities around the world, uh, you know, names like uh, Michigan, names like Georgia Tech, names like uh, Princeton, uh, Yale, Imperial College London, uh, IIM Calcutta, Indian School of Business in Hyderabad, who create content which is then available on the Coursera platform. And then we work with institutions and we work with businesses, governments, and campuses to bring all of this learning. You know, when you see the, the, the 2,500 number that you see here are the businesses that we work with. And because we work with many businesses around the world, we have a very good understanding of what are the skills of the future that they are looking to build. And we are able to then understand that by our work with businesses and bring those to students in campuses as well. So Coursera for Campus is our platform, which is uh, designed to enable and prepare students for jobs of the future. It has five key elements. One is content. Like I spoke about, these are what is called MOOC courses, but they're also longer form content on the Coursera platform from top universities and companies. Second, earlier this year, we launched authoring. You know, in today's world, uh, uh, universities and colleges should not only be thinking about consuming content from other top universities, but also creating their own content. And authoring enables a college or a university to enable their faculty to author you know, projects, assessments, and courses. Uh, third, a couple of months ago, we, we launched hands-on learning, and we launched something called guided projects. And I'll speak a little bit about that in just a bit. But also, Dr. Doug spoke, spoke a lot about industry experience. And this is designed to enable that and designed to enable that online. Fourth, uh, because we work with 2,500 businesses, we have a very good understanding of essential skills for the future of the skills development dashboard that businesses are looking for. And we bring that to campuses to say, you know, these are the skills that you should be inculcating in your students. And then finally, of course, this is a scalable platform. You know, like I shared, uh, 1.3 million students have taken 20 million hours of learning over March, April, May, June, and July. So all of this has happened in the last five months because of the scalable uh, nature of this platform. Uh, content comes from all of these universities. I won't spend too much time looking at the uh, talking about these. Many people might be familiar with what some of these leading institutions on the Coursera platform are. 
and then there is content across 11 domains so pretty much for any type of higher education institution you know whether it be an engineering school whether it be uh, management whether it be commerce uh, liberal arts life sciences and healthcare arts and humanities social sciences so economics and so on and so forth there are over 4300 courses available and this is what we've been taking to higher education institutions in the country and this catalog is not static it is growing every year we are adding almost 700 800 new courses to our platform because of the wide network of institutions and universities who are creating this content now i spoke about guided projects this is a little bit of what it looks like the idea is that many jobs today require uh, using softwares all of us are using a software right now for this meeting right and so whether you are an engineer or whether you are a management professional or whether you are somebody in sales and marketing many many jobs require softwares and what guided projects does is without purchasing a software without installing it on your machine without buying a computer with high computational power to be able to run that software uh, guided projects can enable a student to learn these softwares in a virtual environment so what you see here is data science is you know a very fast growing field in today's businesses digital and data are the skills that many businesses are building and one of the tools that we use used in data science is tableau and this is an example of how a tableau guided project works on coursera where the right is an instructor screen where the instructor is telling a student how to build a data science project on tableau and the left is the student screen where the student is following along and this is asynchronous right now but it could be a live uh, arrangement as well in two months we've already created uh, 200 projects which range from one to two hours on our platform and by the end of this year our expectation is that we will take this to about a thousand projects many universities and colleges in the country are currently using it because summer internships in person cannot happen they're using guided projects as a proxy for internships by getting actual hands-on learning to happen uh, for their students and then the other thing universities have been doing is integrating Coursera into their curriculum uh, because when you start using Coursera for credit then it becomes very very simple so standalone courses typically are what universities are using if it's a, a domain which the university doesn't teach uh, currently uh, on campus so if it's an engineering school and they don't have int, uh, IOT as a, as a course, they might use a Coursera course. Blended learning, of course, is obvious. Many management schools are using you know, digital marketing and many, many other courses to blend with their uh, curriculum. And then finally, beyond just credit taking learning outside of curriculum to multidisciplinary learning as well. Now, the universities that we've been partnering with over the last uh, few months and over the last year or so tell us that they see these kind of transformational benefits. They are able to deliver job relevant skills to their students to increase employability. That's the first point. Second, universities are able to reduce cost of delivering credit hours, which is contributing to the pressure on tuition fees and cash flow that I spoke about. Third, because faculty time gets saved up because some of this learning can move online. Faculty is able to you know, use their time for mentoring students for also research and development and possibly executive education. Physical infrastructure gets saved as well. So in the same physical infrastructure, a larger student capacity is feasible. And then finally, not just for students, but in you know, ensuring that faculty and staff also build their skills is important. And while a lot of universities have been benefiting from you know, this five month of free licenses, many universities are now getting into three year partnerships with Coursera. And those that have been doing this for the last one, two years, tell us that when they make this investment in, uh, in rupee terms, then they see a 3.5 to 4x return on investment. Uh, just last couple of slides and I'll stop with that. So we launched Coursera for Campus in October last year from New Delhi. And at that point in time, these were some of the universities that we had announced who had adopted Coursera for Campus. And there are names around the world, but in India, Manipal, uh, NMIMS, uh, Shivnadar University, UPS, Pearl Academy, were some of the institutions that had joined and uh, were early adopters. Over the last few uh, months, many universities around the world and in India have uh, also uh, started using Coursera for their students. And these are the long-term uh, programs. So Geetham University, Reva University, uh, Alliance, KL University, of course, for a while, uh, Symbiosis, Hindustan uh, Institute of Technology, and so on and so forth. And then something that we announced last week was a first that we have done. So JNTU, Jawaharlal Nehru Technical University, is the public affiliating university in the state of Telangana. 
and uh, you know they are one of the oldest affiliating universities in the country with 290 colleges and almost 3.5 lakh students uh, coursera has partnered with jntu to now bring for credit learning to their students uh, this has two parts to it out of 160 credits that an engineer needs to take uh, 20 percent of those can now be taken on coursera uh, over a four-year period and also if a student were to take 20 additional credits on the Coursera platform as a part of their engineering, then instead of just a BTEC, they would get a BTEC honors or a BTEC with specialization or minors. And the Commissioner of uh, Technical and Collegiate Education of Telangana and Coursera CEO announced this partnership uh, last week. Mr. Naveen Mittal has been very, very visionary in terms of you know uh, doing this, and this has been the pu first public university to do this. And, and so that's a little bit of how, at least from Coursera's perspective, a lot of transition, a lot of high speed uh, transformation has happened over the last uh, four months. And that's uh, something that I thought I would share with everybody today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Raghav. Thank you so much. Uh, so definitely Coursera is uh, working very hard towards uh, making the courses online. We have, uh, I have received uh, three, four very good questions for you. And I'll take those questions at the end. Uh, before that, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. G.D. Sharma ji. Dr. G.D. Sharma is the, uh, has done his uh, PhD in economics from uh, Bombay University and master's in economics from Jodhpur University. He was awarded honorary degree of doctorate of letters, Nagarjuna University in 1999. Recently retired as director, consortium for educational communication, New Delhi, UGC, from October 2003 to March 2007. Prior to this, served as a senior fellow and head higher education unit, NEPA. He was secretary, University Grant Commission, New Delhi from 1996 to 1999, and also has served as director, IIE Pune, and as a consultant of UNESCO, UNDP, IEP Paris. Uh, sir, you have a very long experience and uh, uh, very uh, deep experience. So we would like to hear from you that how uh, our education institution can play their role in making the, the Bharat as Atmirbar Bharat. Uh, over to you, sir. Meanwhile, Anu, please uh, share Thank the you. screen with me so that yeah, so that I can share the presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Neeraj, and welcome <coughs> all the panelists, and welcome to all of you. In fact, uh, I have some broad areas in which I would like to discuss. Particularly, I would like to say that higher education is at the helm of all the education structure, and it's a mother of all the professions. All the development which we see in the world today is backed by higher education research and development. No other uh, institutions have contributed as much for the development of the country. So it's the core of uh, the system of education. Now, when we are talking of Atmanirvata or self-reliance, the basically concept is that how do we enhance our capability so that we can become self-reliant or Atmanirvata. My title is Higher Education for Atmanirvata. And that's the concept which you say that uh, it is self-reliance and direct bearing on higher education and by bearing on the higher education system. We have a network of higher education systems throughout the country. You can take this day, any district, you will have the college, you will have engineering college, you will have medical college, the nearby area. It's a very good network of uh, higher education system throughout the country. This apex system of higher education can contribute to the development or the taking India to self-reliance. I have taken five more areas in which it can contribute. Latest knowledge of various fields, developing critical and analytical thinking, and application of knowledge for development of economy, which has been the weakest part in our country. Application knowledge for development of country is a little weak, but it's still growing. People and the society, it stands for questioning, which is a today's area, it's very important constructive criticism and reasoning and working for the excellence and well-being of the mankind. That's the basic motto of our education throughout the world, within India or any other part of the world. Now I've chosen five basic areas in which higher education directly contribute to the making India a self light These five areas, next slide. Next slide. Yes, yes sir. These five yes, areas sir. are basically, uh, yeah, it's there. Five areas are basically agriculture, science. Uh, you know that 
we had a problem of food, we had a problem of various uh, issues after the drought. We started agriculture universities, we started extension, agriculture extension, we started the, the uh, Indian Council Agricultural Research, and as a result, in another with the support of a uh, lot of infrastructure, we are, have overcome the problem of food. But we have problem of storing, problem of processing, problem of making the uh, uh, our rural economy as an efficient economy or competitive economy globally is, is absent. And here the spe specific focus should be on developing high agriculture sciences and not only environment and food processing, farmers education, skill development and make it sector competitive globally. That's one area where we have to focus in the, uh, for the making India Atman Devar. There's another area which I like to share with you, engineering sciences to improve the manufacturing and production of goods. And in this area, new aspect, new sources of energy and uh, renewable sources of energy like solar, etc., is going to be. Engineering colleges, etc., have to focus in two areas, one is solar and also creating a storage facility within the energy system, which is where the focus has to be there when we are trying to develop India, going in India for the and third and very important area is economic studies. We have been doing economic studies in various aspects, research and access area, enhancing the productivity and least cost analysis of all the areas, dependence on the method, methods and reduce the dependence on the trade. In fact, if you look at the trade, international trade, we have been in deficit international trade for last 20 years. It's not first time. Now, first time it is being highlighted with between India and China. But basically, our economy has been always in deficit in terms of the in terms of trade. Uh, we are always loser in terms of international trade. In certain areas, we are excelling. Other areas, we are not. Certain specific studies, which is focusing how to reduce this uh, kind of dependence, has to be carried out. And the fourth area is. <clears throat> Health sciences. health sciences. We have progressed on health sciences considerably, but we still need to go into this. And COVID has exposed the system how how strong we are. Our health infrastructures are still not. And edu health education has to take note of this issue, along with the support which is given by the for the development of health infrastructure, animal health as well as the human health. These are the areas which we have to focus in the in the uh, research, education, and health. and the next is a new technology related, of course. AI, IoT, uh, and quantum computing, computer uh, biotechnology interface, which is going to be future of uh, uh, our new, te new technologies and interface and uh, systems communication, which is another area of systems communication. In fact, here systems communication, I'm trying to suggest India has advantage in satellite communication and it has to take the at this advantage, it should advance the, it further as a future of communication through the satellite. Right now we are going through internet, which is very important, but at the same time, satellite will free you from various aspects of the disturbance and then also keep your data, which is another important point, which is how do you protect your data? If you are going through satellite, you are a transponder and all communication takes place in big way. First is the all network connections, etc. will be reduced. China is going big way on a satellite communication. In fact, we are going on energy also in this area. But I think we have to focus on satellite communication. So these are the five focused areas in which we should try to work for the making India and Atman Dharma. Otherwise, you might be talking a lot, but it, it has its focus has to be done. Now, here I'm suggesting five action points, action, action plans for the students and action plan for the teachers, action plan for the system also. The, what is the action plan I'm suggesting? Providing generic and specific knowledge, skills and aptitude to the students to deal with the problems or development of regions where the institutions are located. In fact, we have a, a person knows everything outside the world. He knows more about America. He knows more about other countries. He knows more about but it doesn't know what his region is. What are the climatic conditions of the region? How the region is responding to the development, etc. Which is not. I think we have to really relate them. Of course, globally, it, it should be universal knowledge is universal, but at the same time, it has to be contextual. And therefore, I, our action point for the student is make them more uh, focus on the development of region where the institutions are located. Encourage them to do innovative and out-of-box thinking, which we are not uh, encouraging right now. In fact, whole system of examinations, etc., is trying to stop them from out-of-box thinking. 
deal with the challenge of the to become self-reliant. In fact, self-reliant word has almost been missing in the education system for the last 10 or 15 years. Once we went into the uh, liberalization, we thought that everything would be solved by liberalization. Self-reliant issue was, uh, was taken out of the discussion. I think there is this is, has to be taken. These are the two points which we should action plan, we should do for the school student. Next is involve student to document the knowledge of the indigenous solutions and use of science to ref, uh, refine and modify the may, modify and make such knowledge universally applicable. I think we have a lot of knowledge. Many there are few good books published in this area: Indian science, Indian uh, art, culture, etc. But we have not yet made it more uh, verified and even health sciences, etc. We have not uh, verified, made it globally. Although I think focus should be in this area, and students should be involved, and because they are located, in, they can have an interaction with the masses, interaction with the few, uh, area where they are. Next is prepare them to deal with the emerging AI and IoT and computer wide uh, computer wide technology interface and quantum computing. I think this has become a need of the time. Of course, many times people say IoT has become uh, internet of threats, which is because cyber attacks, etc., which is they are taking place. But we have to be very uh, uh, much trained in this area, and our every student should be trained in this new technology, which is why I call fourth industrial revolution technology. No one can look at it. What are the development which are taking place under the fourth industrial uh, revolution, and that is going to be very important. That's going to be future because how so whatever we might like to do, because technology is going to be uh, around us, and we have to deal with this issue. So students have to be also focused. Provide opportunity to dial that. This is another area where we must focus when we are trying to develop the student. Field activity of each and undergraduate, which is missing right now. PG student do some kind of work, but not undergraduate students, and they should be involved directly. In this should include the business, industry, agriculture, social and economic and political organization to study and understand and improve and uh, various vocations and jobs. In fact, it should become part and parcel of the degree program. Unless we make it a part of personal degree program, unless we make it as a credit earning system, it would not uh, achieve much. So these five action points, action plan for the students, uh, which I'm suggesting for making India as a self-reliant and urban. Now there are points for the teachers. Similar to the five action plan, plan I suggested for the teachers. The teacher five action plans is engage in documentation of indigenous knowledge in their field of studies and critically assess their usefulness or otherwise in helping people to solve the problems. I think we we have certain problems solving systems, but we are not verified, we are not checked up. Our <clears throat> bank of knowledge, uh, et cetera, which is really not some uh, aspects are being done by NISTA and other area, but still we need to do expand in this field. Engage in communicating that and transferring the knowledge innovatively. Our transferring knowledge is as, or as old as it is but uh, we have to rethink about how to transfer the knowledge innovatively. The modern communication system and technology and teaching and learning process focus on application of problem solving. I think focus of all education system as well as teaching, as well as evaluation should be application of knowledge and problem solving. If we change that one, probably things would undergo some change. Next. Yes. Engage. Uh, it has gone, uh, Ronald. It is coming, sir. Yeah. Please. Hello. Hello. It is sir, Masal. You are self muted, sir. Please unmute yourself. So please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself, sir. Uh, uh, engage the research for creation of knowledge and relevant sectors of, for their application in this specialization. We have to look into specialization of teachers, specialize their area, and they should engage in this area. Analyze the areas and aspects where India is dependent on other countries to assess 
whether India can competitively develop in that area, aspects keeping in view there are specialization and interests. I think that is the area where the focus of teachers should be there. Are we really, whether it's a physics, it's a chemistry, or it's economics or another area, you have to really look into with this kind of where we can really become uh, contribute or competitively develop. Engage for peer group and students to have pride in locally produced goods and services and help improving them wherever required. Let me share you with a very interesting experience in uh, South Korea. I was uh, telling a, a, a person that I would like to travel by another airline. A interpreter sitting with me, no, 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 why don't you travel by my Korean airline? Why don't you do it? The kind of feeling that he had for the Korean airline was really communicating to me that he has a pride in this, the product which they are having. Next. Yeah. Now there are five points for the organizations where in fact organizations are key to all the problems, all the solutions, both problems and solutions both. Give enough scope for experiment and exploration to teachers in their respective fields. I think this is where we are, we are doing too, too much of micromanagement. I often say that let let it be there be some mistakes some problems but let us give them explore uh, scope for exploration and experimentation and the teachers would do their best in this process some may not do it, but it doesn't matter but those who do they'll contribute a lot give autonomy to their work uh, to do, do their work and never micromanage the system we have gone too much of micromanagement which is uh, dangerous for the autonomy and development of the, uh, knowledge and decentralize the system of higher education with regard to uh, governance, funding, admissions, evaluation of students, and quality assurance and assessment. We have to look into these areas. In fact, uh, we are getting into too much of this centralization. In UGC, also, they say we should all condense that let there be autonomy to the people, let them control their their uh, their work and etc. We should not really think. These are the five areas in which we should try to focus for making India, taking India to the Atmundar Vrata. Same thing for organization which is, or, or for any other areas which are. Basically, I would like to say we have to really focus now. We have been talking many things, many achievements are there. In fact, uh, digitally we have been working on various fields. Many institutions have come up, about, about more than 1,000 universities are there, 40,000 colleges are there. But in terms of outcome in terms of students coming and contributing to the development of India is just still a major challenge. And this challenge we have to meet. Thank you very much for more open for questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Jiri Sharmaji, for this wonderful insight. Uh, uh, now we have uh, with us uh, Professor K.K. Agrawalji. Sir, we would like to listen to you. Professor K.K. Agrawalji, is the chairman of uh, National Board of Accreditation. Professor Agrawal obtained his Bachelor of Engineering degree from Punjab University and Master's degree from uh, NIT Kurukshetra. Later, he did his uh, PhD also from uh, NIT Kurukshetra. And after a distinguished service of 27 years at NIT Kurukshetra, Professor Agrawal served as a Pro Vice Chancellor, GGO Hisar, for a period of three years and then as Founder Vice Chancellor of uh, GGS Indraprasth University, Delhi, for a period of 10 years. He has been president of the Institution of Electronics Telecommunication Engineers for the period of 2002 to 4, president Computer Society of India from 2007 to 9, and president of South Asia, Southeast Asia Regional Computer Conf uh, Confederation from 2008 to 10. Professor Agrawal has published approximately 400 papers in the reputed journals, about 50% of these in international journals. He has been widely consulted by the industries, most notable being his contribution towards the reliability analysis of, for PSLV. Professor Agrawal was conferred the honorary fellowship by Broadcast Society of India. He was uh, decorated with Lifetime Achievement Award by IET and also by Computer Society of India. Uh, sir, uh, with this uh, wonderful experience of education industry, uh, definitely we will be uh, listening to you on talking the uh, role of our education institution, Atmirbar Bharat, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Neeraj. Thank you, Neeraj, for uh, nice words. Uh, Thank you, sir. We have in this uh, panel here Dr. Abhay Jire, who really gave an uh, air of innovation to the country's technical education, particularly. And uh, I personally feel that's real 
necessity of the time. Dr. Anita Gupta, head NSTDB, um, Dr. A.K. Garat, Director, uh, International Cooperation and Bilateral Trade, uh, Dr. G.D. Sharma, former Secretary UGC, Mr. Raghav Gupta, Managing Director, uh, Coursera India, Dr. A. Garat, Director, KIT Group of Institutions, uh, Mr. Swapnil Jain, CEO, OAI Robotics, uh, Mr. Neeraj Aroda, uh, Dr. Preeti Chattara, and uh, about 1,000 uh, uh, participants. Uh, friends, it's a pleasure to be a part of uh, this very eminent uh, panel and uh, having about 1,000 uh, uh, participants attending the program. Actually, one of the beauties of webinars over seminars, which I have uh, found is, number one, you start on time. Seminars really never started on time. We, we had to wait half an hour, 40 minutes and all that. But webinars normally start within five minutes or so. And second is you utilize the full capacity. Thousand on thousand is never possible in a physical environment. So looking to the positive side of it, uh, webinars uh, have given a different kind of boost to the knowledge dissemination uh, as compared to the face-to-face -face mode. And, uh, as such, um, and uh, Neera Jaroda have been doing a lot of it. So my compliments to them for uh, being a part of knowledge dissemination in a big way. Thank you, sir. Our friends, when we talk about uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat and role of higher education, uh, before I come to role of higher education, I find, uh, let me take a minute on Atmanirbhar Bharat. See, sometimes the words are taken in their letter, not in the spirit. And in the process, we sometimes create a lot of uh, a problem. Uh, we are very happy to ban the Chinese apps, but we are not happy to ban the Coursera courses. So Atmanirbhar cannot be just one definition uh, to take care of everything. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, give you a very small story, which tells, which tells you how to present yourself to make sure that you get the best out of it. Uh, there was a person called uh, Zoner, and just about 20 years ago, in a seminar, he asked uh, the audience, he says, I, I have a very serious chemical in mind, and I want your vote whether to ban it. And he said, I described the chemical. The Mohit is with some doctor, Nikhil Gaye. Yes, sir, please. Okay. Uh, he, he said that he wants to talk about a chemical called dihydrogen monoxide. And he said, I'll give you the following evidence about this chemical. He says it can cause severe burns while it is in gas form. Number two, it corrodes and rusts metal. Number three, it kills countless amounts of people annually. Number four, is commonly found in tumors, acid rain, etc. Number five, it causes excessive urination and bloating if consumed. And he says, it is able to kill you if you become too much dependent upon you and then you are deprived of it for a few days. Then he asked the audience, should this chemical be banned? And 85% people said, yes, if it is such a bad thing, it should be banned. And uh, later on, he explained that this chemical, right, hydrogen monoxide, is just the name of water, H2O, which he just named it as uh, dihydrogen monoxide. It is H2O. And whatever five properties I have told are true for water. Uh, it can cause severe burns while it is in gas form, which is true. It corrodes and rusts metal, it is true. It kills countless amounts of people annually, it is true. It's commonly found in tumors, acid rain, etc. It is true. It causes excessive urination and bloating if consumed, it is true. If you become so much dependent upon it, it can kill you if you are deprived of it, it is true. So he said, uh, and all of you voted for, most of you voted for it to be banned. So the question is, how do you present a case? How do you interpret a situation? And then how do you make of a situation? Uh, there is no lie which was uh, there in the presentation of this uh, young man called Zona. And this phenomena is now called Zonarism. Uh, as to how you can present something 
uh, to drive home your point of view, uh, right or wrong. And mind you, uh, there is no lie in the whole uh, uh, presentation. It's all a fact of truth. So when we say Atmanirbhar Bharat, well, all of us love the word Atmanirbhar. Uh, we, we are proud of the fact that we were uh, not only Atmanirbhar, we were Vishwa Guru. And uh, I was once asked to give a talk on sustainability in a webinar. And they said, sir, uh, we want a webinar in Hindi. I looked for the translation of the word sustainability in Hindi, and I couldn't find proper translation of the word sustainability in Hindi because in our culture, it was probably ne never needed. We were sustainable by design. We were sustainable by our style of life. And therefore, uh, sustainability was not to be talked about. It was in our blood. It was in our style of function. So when we say Atmanirbhar Bharat, I was just thinking of a child. When a child is born, from day one, he's dependent on mother, he's dependent upon uh, then uh, sisters and brothers and family members. Then comes a stage when he becomes, when he tries to become independent. Uh, well, he may like to play with whomsoever he likes. He may like to sometimes uh, disobey his mother and still go to play so because he, he loves to be independent. That is the challenge of his life. Uh, I want to be independent. But then finally, he realizes that life is not about independence. Life is about interdependence. We have to be working in teams. We have to be taking cooperation from each other. Uh, we have to be uh, supporting each other. So the journey of life, according to me, is from, uh, in the, from dependent to independent to interdependent. So Atmanirbhar, when we say, well, uh, this is how I mean it, I really don't uh, uh, know what the powers to be mean it. I, I mean uh, dependence at our cost, dependence on our terms. Uh, this country has always delivered great whenever it was challenged. Whether you talk long back PL 480, when wheat was refused to us, we became not only self-sufficient in wheat, we became exporter of wheat. Our science and technology, when atomic energy was pushed to the challenge, uh, they did it right here. When we were looking towards uh, all the birds in the all the countries in the world to launch our satellite, now they come to us to launch their satellites. So we we were uh, uh, delivering whenever required, and same has been shown in the domain of education. When we were uh, thrust to a situation where classes cannot be held where uh, it, it, it was just not, not possible face-to-face -face classroom. Uh, it happened and happened, uh, I must say, reasonably well. Uh, so the point which I'm trying to say is uh, Atmanirbhartha should be taken in the context of uh, what I want. Can I get it done on my terms? And uh, whenever the need, of course, uh, there are uh, so many eminent panelists from the domain of science and technology, they bear me out that most of the fundamental researches have happened either during the wars or during the necessities which are felt during the war. It is a different matter that many of these were concluded after the wars and many of them uh, gave rise to many side effects uh, which were even more important than what was being felt at the war time. One example which I give is uh, when we were looking for a lightweight material for our aircraft and missile, we ultimately ended up with lightweight calipers for handicapped children using the same material. And this has benefited millions of children all over the world. Uh, very few missiles, maybe very few rockets, but millions of children. So which uh, benefits bear uh, is a question. Uh, in the COVID-19 uh, situation also, uh, Abe has been trying for innovation in all conceivable uh, manners in arranging all possible events. But <clears throat> unless it goes into the blood of the youth, uh, it really will take time. And that is our challenge. I mean, now we could come up with a ventilator which is the size of a kitchen toaster. Why could it happen earlier? We could now think of that a uh, uh, a hat which the which the driver 
beers for oxygen supply just with the help of a small valve can be converted into a ventilator and that valve can be 3d printed using a printer which costs less than 10000 rupees so that's a, a given a necessity we can come up to a situation and deliver very well and that is according to me atmanirbhar nobody should be able to take us for granted nobody should be able to hold us to ransom we should be able to uh, do our job perfectly well on the terms we wish are uh, not that we don't want to talk to anyone else we don't want to take support from anyone else we don't want to uh, uh, do collaborative research we don't want to do collaborative projects that's not my definition of atmanirbhar uh, uh, bharat now coming to role of higher education institutions uh, which is really the thrust area of uh, uh, this webinar uh, i believe uh, well transformation for anything in any country according to me the only mode is education i may be little biased belonging to education domain but the transformation really happens through education and only through education uh, just before lockdown i was uh, delivering a convocation address in a big university and the media people at the end say uh, sir can you give one word uh, advice to the graduates I said one word advice sir. Uh, but let me use two words they said okay i said creative learning unless we can give creative learning to the youth they must be able to learn themselves i have no mechanism on our to teach them whatever the need in life it was always impossible it is more impossible now half life of a software engineer is 18 months now if whatever i teach has to become outdated in 18 months what do i do and i don't know what we do and the present statistics tell me that 65% of the children today do not know what job will they take what will be the challenge areas uh how many jobs they will change statistics is about 10 many of uh, us in this panel would have probably joined uh, our job and are continuing there all our life and will retire from that but today's youth changes about 10 jobs and we from higher education system are expected to prepare him or her for all those 10 jobs successfully done which neither he knows nor i know nor the industry knows now that's a challenge and therefore innovation and creativity is the only method by which we can really ensure uh, self dependence of the graduate self dependence of the institutions and uh, self dependence of the country so that is the area where we have to really focus upon uh, i was addressing the i think incident the gaziabad management association only dr garg is here his institution is there and they were talking about 5 trillion dollar economy and i said uh, well i i i don't really understand 5 trillion as how many zeros but the point is uh, growth is important we want to go to the growth and that growth can come only from education and i did say forget about make in india if you cannot make engineers in india who are worthy of making in india uh, forget about startup india if you cannot pay make graduates who can start up themselves who can stand upon their own feet uh the question does not arise so we unless we make uh, quality consciousness in higher education uh, our primary factor syllabus whether you cover 50 or 60 or 70 i mean uh, personally uh, i i care less but somehow we could sell the ideas over all these years that grades in examination is the only important factor of life the bag of the school bag uh, weight of the school bag is a very important parameter uh whether you are a plus or a will make or mar your life if you are able to get in an engineering college or a medical college then only you make your people parents feel proud otherwise you are shame on society now these are the kinds of hypotheses which we sold to our students which we sold to our youth and uh, in the process harm them endlessly we now talk about industry 4.0 which uh, i think many of you refer to even dr garg referred in when we talk about ai it iot 3d blockchain uh, virtual reality augmented reality so on and so forth uh, mind you one beauty of these uh, technologies is that they are not 
the sole domain of engineers. Artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, uh, 3D printing can be good for engineers, scientists, commerce graduates, economics graduates, arts graduates, and so on and so forth. So ultimately, we are trying to build a good house over a variety of foundations. And that is the uh, beauty which will take this country uh, forward and upward. And we have to uh, create a very great focus on this. Uh, coupled with the value system of the country, which is our USP. No country in the world has ever grown without realizing its USP and without following its USP. If I talk about USP of USA, they said we'll, we'll make the roads which will take us to the heavens. Uh, talk about UK, they said textiles is enough to take us to the top of the world. Uh, Arab countries, oil is enough for us to take. Uh, Denmark, they said only on the basis of milk will go to the top of the world and so on and so forth. So what do we have in India to go to the top of the world? It's only gray matter here, uh, which we have to use in plenty, use fully, and that only will take us to the uh, top of the world. And COVID has forced us that we must realize this, we must encash this, and we must uh, uh, put a lot of uh, weight in this. Friends, uh, knowledge is like a surface in the sea, and disruptions always come as waves. Uh, I, have, I have never seen a sea, and none of you, which doesn't have waves. And waves is a beauty of uh, things, so disruptions will come, and we will have to learn to face disruption. All seas have survived with disruptions. I, if we would have wished to have a sea without disruption, we would have probably failed. So disruptions will keep on coming in our knowledge journey, and we'll have to keep on learning to live with it. And I read a paper which says uh, waves are not of the same uh, height. If you stand uh, on the beach for some time, you will find some waves of this height, some waves of this height, some waves of this height. So a natural phenomena is disruptions will never be uniform. Disruptions will never be predictable. You will not be able to say what will be the size of disruptions. You will have to be prepared for disruptions of all sizes, all shapes, all scales. And uh, COVID has told us, for all of us living, that this is the largest disruption which we have seen and hope we never see it again. And uh, we learn to face with it. And few changes in higher education which are very, very evident. Number one, education, I again repeat, will have to be creative, innovative. Without that, education will cease to have the meaning. I'm making a strong statement, but uh, routine education, which tells me how to solve a differential equation in the examination hall, or how to write the theory of economics, uh, will not take us very far. We'll have to make our students creative, innovative, and learnable. Uh, that's one thing. Second thing is we will have to make sure that there is a lot of interdisciplinary quotient amongst all our courses. This over and super specializations, uh, which has been the trend, uh, probably will have to change a little bit and we'll have to give breadth and equal value uh, as the height. We'll have to strike a balance between the two. Otherwise, we are losing something. Uh, even PhDs all over the world now people are saying, uh, only knowledge about, just as the Heisenberg principle said, uh, knowing everything about nothing uh, doesn't take us uh, very far. We'll probably be better off knowing something about everything, uh, in addition to knowing more about some things. So that uh, property we will have to inculcate our systems. Interdisciplinarity, let a mechanical engineer be engineer first, and then mechanical engineer. I mean, I, I always said we, we somehow lost track of pyramid of education. Firstly, we must be good human beings. And somebody said entire education journey can be summarized in one sentence. How can you be from a human being to being human? So let's learn to be human. So that is our first platform. Second story is to be, say, engineer or scientist. And third story is uh, to be mechanical engineer or uh, this. And maybe fourth story is, uh, um, air conditioning engineer and so on and so forth. Uh, unless we keep this pyramid in mind, we will not be able to solve uh, the disruptions which will keep on uh, uh, happening and we will have to connect with it. We will have to tackle the problems uh, holistically. 
critical thinking, problem solving, decision taking, risk taking will have to be the attributes for all higher education graduates, uh, irrespective of the uh, degree, irrespective of the institution. And finally, friends, I think institutions will have to learn to collaborate amongst themselves very strongly. Uh, the student's demands will be so much that no single institution will be able to take care of everything. He says, I want an electronics engineering degree, but I like only 30 of your subjects. I don't like 10 of your subjects. Allow me to take it from Coursera, take it from uh, MIT, take it from uh, uh, Swayam, take it from Coursera, whatever. And you will have to accept it and believe it and uh, uh, deliver it. Uh, one thing which I have suggested, which is for policymakers, I think an analysis of the con country's COVID situation where the students took courses in addition to their university courses from courses and all that will tell us what is their appetite of knowledge. Uh, why did they take those courses which are not in their curriculum? And they went to Coursera, they went to edX and opted for those courses. I think we must not turn blind eye to this. We must uh, uh, find out those and design our curriculum according to them. Ultimately, uh, the final rule of higher education is we are for the youth, youth is not for us. And I think uh, uh, with these words, I thank uh, SHM and Kite for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this uh, very eminent panelist. And ho I hope uh, it will lead to the desired results. Thank you so much, Neeraj. Take forward. Thank you, thank you thank so you, much, sir. sir. Thank you so much for this energetic uh, 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 session. Definitely, sir, uh, we still need to focus on the quality of education fundamental and basics of education, and then entrepreneurship, uh, making the students innovative. I think this is the key to uh, making the Bharat as Atmanirbhar Bharat, because this will not come from outside, this will come from inside only, and our education institutions will have to play a vital role for that. Uh, now, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Abhay Jiri. Dr. Abhay Jiri uh, is the Chief Innovation Officer, Ministry of HRD, Government of India. Dr. Abhay Jiri is uh, currently the Chief Innovation Officer for Ministry of HRD. Before joining Ministry, Dr. Jiri was uh, Chief Scientist, Life Sciences and R&D, Head for Persistent uh, Systems Limited. Dr. Jiri is uh, very passionate about building vibrant innovation ecosystems, especially in higher education institutions, and is working in this area since 2012. That's wonderful. Since uh, then, uh, he has organized many innovation initiatives at national and local level to identify and connect innovations and innovators with mentors and investors. He is also the brain and driving force behind annual initiative Smart uh, India Hackathon, which has now evolved as world's biggest open innovation model with participation from large number of central ministries, state government, thousands of education institutions, lakhs of students and hundreds of industries. Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi has personally applauded this initiative multiple times. So. Uh, uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, for uh, you know uh, uh, doing so much innovative work at MHRD and uh, uh, connecting our students uh, with the with the innovative things, with the innovations, which is definitely the need of uh, uh, making India as Atmanirbhar Bharat. So over to you, Dr. Abhay. We would like to listen to you, sir. Thank you very much, Neeraji. Sincerely appreciate. First, I would really like to thank Asocham for organizing this discussion, this panel session. And more importantly, I would like to actually thank others who have joined, especially Professor K.K. Agarwal, who is actually heading NBA very in a very dynamic way. Also, he is championing uh, innovation and entrepreneurship at every forum, because whenever I listen to him at multiple other forums, I have seen him talking about this in big way. I'm also thankful to Sharma sir, Dr. G.D. Sharma sir for joining this entire this panel. And of course, my friend Anita Gupta ji, she's a dynamic leader at DST, you know, and we are we are very keen on collaborating uh, on multiple ways. We have been collaborating and uh, in future also we will be collaborating a lot. So she is our person at DST, you know championing innovation and entrepreneurship so first um, so thanks thanks for giving me this uh, opportunity uh, 
as our earlier panelists have already talked about multiple things uh, which uh, our institutions need to do in order to promote innovation and entrepreneurship dr kk agarwal spoke about 5 trillion dollar economy and i would like to take that thread forward because if we want to really emerge as 5 trillion dollar economy then our educational institutes need to emerge as islands of innovation and we really require thousands of such islands of innovation uh, which will compete with each other which will promote right kind of intellectual property and when i look at atmanirbhar bharat huh, uh, my definition for atmanirbhar bharat is not just producing products or ideas for just bharat i am talking about how india can generate ideas which will have global impact so india should be innovation hub and for me atmanirbhar bharat definition of atmanirbhar bharat it's much beyond bharat and we have to really go out and ensure that our ideas capture the world so that's where my work is and i am working with that vision so uh, because currently when we look at things uh, we also need to identify where we are currently standing for example as uh, kk agarwal uh, sir rightly said that just banning chinese apps is not going to be the solution are we creating enough intellectual property within our country and if i have to share with you some small stats then i will tell you last year's ip filing status of china versus india or china versus -vis india and us versus -vis india last year as per the data china filed about 13.5 lakh ip applications us filed about 6.5 lakh so china is already more than double of us and india filed only 45000 so if we are talking about competing with china then the kind of gap which we really need to fill is really very substantial from 45000 to 6.5 lakh you know hey sorry 13.5 lakh 13.5 lakhs it's it's really very huge and more importantly out of this 45000 ip which is filed in india 45 uh, about uh, 65 to 70% of ip is filed by nris non resident indians out of this 45000 so the actual ip generated from this country of 1.3 billion people is extremely low if you really just look at ip which is getting generated from our educational institutes where we have more than 40000 educational institutes about 800 800 800 900 universities and 10000 plus technical institutes if you put all this thing together the amount of ip which we actually end up generating is anywhere between 2500 to 3000 extremely low so the question we really need to ask is that whether only ideas get generated in us or china and whether our people are dumb people the answer is no what we really need to do or what we really are missing currently is taking idea logically forward that is currently not happening and the reason that is currently not happening is because one on one side the ecosystem is an issue but more than ecosystem our mindset is an issue as kk agarwal sir rightly said that we are still pushing students to get into marks based or grade based mindset and we are not changing or 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 making that shift to innovation and entrepreneurship based mindset and if we cannot do that then our problem solving skills our critical thinking skills are going to be very very low recently ministry of human resource development actually did a study 
with help of Stanford University, where we compared our engineers with Chinese engineers and Russian engineers. And if you really look at that study, we found that our Indian engineers are far below par as compared to Chinese and Russian engineers in terms of problem solving. So we may be good at very good at theory, but when we have to implement that theory to solve any particular problem, we are really struggling. And we really need to focus on those aspects. If we can emerge as a problem as a generation of problem solvers, then the problem may be local, the problem may be global. Our people will go ahead and conquer it, or our people will go ahead and solve it. So Currently, our education system is not allowing us to evolve as problem solvers. And who is actually killing good ideas? Our teachers, our parents, and our societies are end up killing our good ideas. Because many times, because of this grade-based, marks-based kind of a mindset, if a person, or if a student or a youngster goes to his teacher or some mentor or uh, someone in family, they ask him why you want to focus on all these things, just focus on your studies, how many marks you are getting. So currently that mindset is also there. So we felt that we should do something about it. So last year, we actually started a program called as MBA in Innovation, Entrepreneurship and Venture Development. So what we realized when we spoke to these large number of youngsters is that their spouses or their girlfriends, boyfriends, or their parents are actually hampering uh, their urge for entrepreneurship. So we said that let's start a program, which will be an incubator-based program, with the, where uh, the classroom component will be maybe 20% or 30%, but it will be more of an experiential learning program. So what we said was that the students can join this program as a team. So they can tell the world that they are doing MBA. Their parents can tell the world that my kid or my son or my daughter is doing MBA. But under the garb of that MBA, they will be actually doing entrepreneurship. And they will work on their startups. And if they succeed as startups, then they will get out or pass that course as an entrepreneur. If their startup fails, that's okay then they will actually become more intrapreneurs, which is also the requirement of large number of companies. So we are testing this model. We have, uh, we have now started this course last year in four institutions across country. This year, we have approved about 16 more institutions to actually run this course. But the initial results which we have got uh, from this uh, new model are quite phenomenal and students are really uh, gaining a lot based on their feedback because what because this MBA being an incubator based program they are doing a lot of experiential learning kind of they are going through that experiential learning process rather than just doing some theory work so this is extremely critical if we really want to move this education system towards Atmanirbhar Bharat. Another important thing which I realize and I talk about this at every place is that about our demographic dividend, which is we are not utilizing it in a right way. For example, if you really look at our technology institutions, we have more than 80 lakh students who are in area of technology or who are doing technology, okay? And every student has to do six months project in his three years or four years of his course. But what happens is that they end up doing a lot of copy pasting. Professor Google is with them. And the kind of projects, reports which they develop or which they generate are really not even worth the toilet paper. But if you do back of the envelope calculation about the energy which gets invested, by all the students across this country is somewhere between 5 to 10 lakh person years per year. It's a, it's a substantial amount of investment in terms of energy. You know, I, it's a time required actually for human evolution. And what happens that this entire energy is going down the drain. Because either, as I said, we do copy-pasting 
or we work on something extremely theoretical, which is useless for all. And we are not focusing on real life challenges. So we are in a very, very uh, unique position in this country is that we have zillions of problems on one side, which needs to be solved and which really don't require rocket science kind of solutions. And on the other side, we have millions of these youngsters which could be creative or which could be pushed towards uh, in a right way if we do it, where they can be those problem solvers, but we are not getting them on a single platform or we are not actually connecting them. And if we want to achieve this Atmanirbhar Bharat thing, then this connection has to be very, very critical. You can do it through Unnat Bharat scheme or you can do it through many other schemes. One of the things which we felt wh why this is not happening is, as I said before, is the mindset. And we really need to work on mindset of teachers. We really need to work on mindset of professors. We need to really work mindsets of management of the institutes. Because still they are into complete academic based approach. And to change that mindset to innovation and entrepreneurship is going to be a very, very big tectonic shift. And if we want to achieve that tectonic shift, it is not going to be a one day job or a one year job. It is going to be a continuous process. And institutes like Asocham and, uh, and the panelists here, we have to go out and talk again and again, you know, convey this message again and again, very, very importantly, to ensure that these things actually percolate, not within just the educational institutes or youngsters, but also within the society, so that we, we as society actually emerge as entrepreneurial society, so that we can create or generate ideas which will have global relevance. I think uh, I will stop here because there are two more speakers and actually we are uh, behind time. So I have taken about to, uh, 12, 12, 13 minutes or so of my time. Uh, <laughs> and if there are any questions, I can certainly talk because we have to finish in uh, by five o'clock and two more speakers are there. Any, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Abhay. Uh, your your uh, session was extremely wonderful. And definitely uh, our audience, I mean, still we have 900 plus delegates listening to this program, so which is wonderful. And I'm sure they are getting something out of it. And they also want to listen that how innovation is required uh, to you know to uh, to make the bharat as admirable bharat and your point was absolutely valid that we should not uh, keep restricted to us till bharat we should go beyond bharat and uh, this should be the the way of uh, looking looking the things now we have uh, a wonderful eminent speaker with us dr anita gupta dr anita ji uh, is the scientist g advisor and head nstdb department of science and technology she is a doctorate in engineering from iit delhi by qualification and an administrator by profession with over 20 years of experience in managing government of india led programs on innovation and entrepreneurship so uh, madam uh, this is wonderful that we have another uh, speaker for or uh, um, talking on innovation and entrepreneurship she is uh, currently heading uh, uh, currently head of innovation and entrepreneurship in the department of science and technology and recently conceived uh, and uh, formulated an exclusive program cawach to tap support and accelerate market deployable COVID-19 startup solutions. She has been a lead catalyst in establishing over 150 technology business incubators at institutions of academic excellence, including IITs, IIMs, NITs, and leading private universities. She has also have uh, been instrumental in uh, carving out a new umbrella initiative, Nidhi, National Initiative for uh, Developing and Harvesting Innovations under Prime Minister National Initiative of Startup India. Wonderful uh, uh, thing, madam. Uh, so we would like to listen to you. Over to you. Thank you. Unmute yourself, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, Neeraj, just uh, give me a sense of how much time do I have so that I design and uh, I think I'll do away with my presentation part. Uh, 
uh, I'll speak uh, more. But in fact, my job has been easier because all eminent speakers have spoken uh, the real uh, essence of to be how to be Atnirbhar in the context of uh, higher education institution uh, institutions and education. So I think uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Abhay Jhar has also talked about the why there is so much critical requirement to infuse the culture of innovation and entrepreneurship. So I'll be more specific. Just give me a sense. How much time do I have? We have eight to ten minutes, ma'am. We have complete time. So okay. So I'm, minutes, I'm, uh, I'm not. I, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, yeah, making the presentation. So just to see, everyone has talked about, uh, and everyone is fully aware that the course of human history and progress has been shaped up by, uh, be it the uh, imagination, inspiration, invention, and innovation. And no better time, uh, no one uh, in a century could have witnessed or be prepared about this kind of crisis which we are facing. It's a unprecedented uh, sort of crisis. And uh, the positive part is that it has created a new world order in virtual every domain if you talk about. And also it has given us a time to introspect ourselves, revisit uh, the, uh, the way we have taken so many things for granted. So it is the best time, be it an individual, uh, be an institution, be an organization, be the government. See, we have to really, uh, we are mapping where are we, what, what are we lacking, and what needs to be the next charter for the future. So I, I think uh, this is the best part. We have realized, uh, we have done, everyone has done their own SWOT analysis, and um, no better time, Although, see, we have the Indian psyche mindset is when something is thrust upon, then only we start working on it. Although we are uh, aware of our problems, uh, we but like the the, uh, the inner drive or the seriousness only comes when something is uh, really thrust upon. And that's how when a clarion call of being Atnirbhar has been given um, uh, right from our head of our a nation, it's, it's a no better time. We have to really pull up our socks. Uh, and when we realize and analyze that, like, uh, we uh, beat any sector, see, the strength of uh, any chain is only deterred by, by the weakest link. So, what are those weak, uh, weakest links? We have to really figure out. You, you start with an education system. Uh, Dr. K.K. Agrawal, uh, Dr. G.D. Sharma has clearly out outlined and in, in the inaugural speech, Dr. Garg has also clearly um, highlighted what are those missing pieces, what are the missing links which really we need to focus on. We really had to sit down and what we have been talking about since ages, the time the time has come really to act upon. So this is the this is the time to really put uh, put everything on rapid action mode. We cannot wait uh, because uh, although uh, we have taken this particular year as a year of introspection, devising a new programs, and we should not sit like uh, idle because I know most of the people are under uh, distress, whether it's an organ like institution, students, um, they have been, uh, they must have been offered jobs as a part of uh, placement. I do not know what is the scenario because the company at the other end are also face facing uh, a different scenario. So everything uh, has uh, actually got disturbed. But um, uh, nonetheless, we have to work on key, the show must go on. And that's how really we need to plan in a very systematic, organized way. Every information, every mapping, every analysis, and um, the way forward roadmap has to devise accordingly. And I'm happy that like, uh, see, just to share an example, while DST has been pioneers of uh, uh, coming out with a variety of initiatives targeting only the higher education institutions. Why? Because we considered higher education institutions as the seedbeds of new ideas, new knowledge. Although what uh, Dr. Jere has highlighted, we still have a, such a long way to go. If you see the parameters uh, in terms of patents and generation of IPs, but uh, the uh, another thing is like we do have a demographic dividend and what more what better example can we get when india needed the most in terms of covid 19 our our talented people our technical people have really uh, made us proud they have worked day in and day even overworked 
and um, we have really been able to leverage the power of collaboration the way we used to talk about industry is not coming forward we have never seen a better example uh, where all governments are collaborating industry is collaborating institutions are collaborating startups are collaborating what better example uh, really we can think of just to say like everyone has witnessed when we started in mid march when it was uh, covid was declared as a pandemic and there was uh, fear and apprehension uncertainty all over that still is uncertainty we do not know when it is going to end but no one stopped working in fact government had really worked wonder no pps were there everything was getting imported no diagnostic kits were there indigenous ones and look at the situation as of now we are number 2 in the pps uh, we are even started uh, exporting we generated 7000 crores worth of uh, revenue through pps and so is the case of diagnostic kits so uh, it's not that like given if there is a sense of purpose there is a criticality of time our our people can really deliver only thing is like we have to put uh, systems in order we have to see and this happened because government mobilized all the resources um, as uh, uh, the program we conceived at the fag end of uh, march uh, in a flat 3 days time was kavach program kavach is a shield and it was really appropriately named uh, because startups we we actually uh, had lot of confidence that they will really come out with some of the indigenous solutions uh, which india needs at this critical juncture of time of such a acute health crisis and i am happy to share like within two weeks of calls we got really good um, 826 startup solutions which were really because we focused on only near to market ready solutions given the we had only 6 months of time frame to deploy these and also engage see this this is given us a time uh, when we have the minimum viable product which has been validated because validation is so critical of these solutions we are we cannot play with the uh, life of people here so all approvals in place all regulatory approvals in place how do we really tie up for scaling up the manufacturing and there we have seen real the uh, how the uh, power of collaboration have beautifully worked and it has really reduced the time the uh, time uh, by i think 1 1/6 1/6 and we have many solutions uh, you talk about it's a, a, a first invasive icu uh, based ventilator by noka robotics we have supported them and it has it, it can work on 12 modes it's out there in the market the entire alumni network of it kanpur work behind it even for sourcing of any sensor from taiwan so they they actually push their entire global network and that's how we uh, uh, the global supply chain has to uh, re really work in that direction so all all the all these aspects uh, have to be factored in when given a clear and similarly so is the case of uh, being atmanirbhar india so atmanirbhar i would like to uh, attach two more a's to it uh, we have to be see atmanirbhar means uh we have to create atmishwas until less that confidence is within ourselves so it has to be coupled with atmishwas it has to be coupled with atmabal empowering if we are not able to empower our institutions our students and how do we empower them with the right set of knowledge skills which will be required by the market going forward all uh, the esteemed panelists have talked about what are the new set of reskilling or the new set of uh, you can say areas to be focused on and uh, i think uh, we really need to come out with a good white paper maybe because after the end of this uh, program which actually charts a real uh, road map uh, for and becomes a guiding tool for anyone who who is interested to be a part of this mission of atmanirbhar india so all those sectors which have been highlighted earlier we were focusing only on the strategic sectors like um, defense uh, nuclear energy those were the ones but uh, when there is another call of being uh, uh, vocal about local so we have to be very inclusive our pm has given five eyes and you can keep on adding many eyes to it but like innovation is a central piece to it and you know education innovation entrepreneurship are the three uh, pillars for uh, charting a new growth strategy for india and dst has variety of programs under nidhi and Uh, as i talked about we also analyze the uh, the link of innovation to 
uh, the chain of innovation to market and there we could uh, figure out like there are certain initial links were totally weak so how could we think of a stronger ecosystem or, or a, uh, you can say innovation to market really uh, getting fruitation because if we if we see the funnel part uh, we we capture uh, through variety of industry led programs or 20 or 1000 ideas across various domains but when we really funnel it and filter it down we come with only 10 to 20 uh, market uh, like uh, viable ideas which are worth commercialization so that means the ideas are uh, just worth a piece of paper so until and unless see that uh, now is the need education system has to really have a hard look critical look and come out with a with a plan uh, which really infuses the missing pieces of design thinking, creativity, problem solving, and see uh, lab work and all. They have to be. We have to really create a class of uh, innovators and uh, a problem solvers. So if we are in in a successful in that mission, who can do the critical thinking? So uh, that creative uh, creative thinking has to be co uh, coupled with the critical thinking and critical thinking has to be coupled with the collaborative thinking so you name i think this is uh, we have to really think very differently in all our aspects uh, we we don't have to look at what we have been doing uh, when there's a now new mission with us we have to really overhaul all our uh, thinking processes the way used to impart education unfortunately covid has really given us a uh, good good time to think over that world is not going to same uh, be same after covid and how do we and virtually where every nation out of 195 has adversely affected every industry sector has been affected um, what could and uh, the uh, name education everyone is getting affected it's a, it's a child to old age so this is this is a really a, a time to come out and evolve uh, with a really transformative uh, kind of uh, agenda and to start with education is the, uh, the the key pillar the key foundation and uh, no better time i think uh, the panelists have really uh, given uh, all uh, the new insights and the new guidance to chart a new course of action and i must say anyone who is interested in terms of offerings for students uh, we have EIR program, Entrepreneur Residence, uh, where we enable our students to really see one has to be really observant what kind of problems one is facing uh, as of now and how can through your intellect knowledge you can really solve them. So until you are observant um, uh, about your surroundings, you won't be able to come. See, nobody is going to tell you this is the problem, that is the problem. You have to figure out as an atma neighbor what are the problems you uh, one need to really focus on and how to how to solve it after that government has multiple programs multiple funding options i think one can really avail of and fortunately this government is really uh, supportive of and bestows a lot of faith in our young generation our creative minds talenting minds only is to mold them properly guide them properly and i think we'll be in next five years will be a differently a new India in the world map. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Madam, uh, for this uh, wonderful message. Uh, definitely, uh, India has uh, all the capabilities within itself. Uh, the only need is to empower our educational institutions uh, with the with the right approach and right uh, right way of thinking, right things. Uh, and yes, uh, India has second largest population in the world. And if if, if you know, right direction is given to this population. We can do wonders. Uh, so, so uh, Neeraj, I just wanted to uh, show. I don't know whether it's visible or not. As I as we speak, I just yeah. got a message. This is a startup from IIT Bombay, uh, Suhani Mohan, and their Saral design has been featured as the top 30 solutions by Forbes magazine under COVID. And she's a woman entrepreneur. Right. And so, uh, yeah, we, we we need to really create new role models, and only the, yes. these new set of role models which get replaced every six months, then I think uh, we'll be creating a massive spiral effect. Definitely, our uh, young youth. Uh, I mean, youth they have uh, lots of creativity, and the only thing is that how our uh, institutions 
how our family is giving them the right direction to utilize their creativity in the right direction in a productive manner so with those uh, words uh, i would like to invite uh, mr sapnil jain mr sapnil uh, you are the last speaker so i know uh, this is uh, your responsibility has increased much mr sapnil jain is uh, right. ceo ori robotics he has vast experience of 17 plus years and is a proficient all rounder when it comes to product uh, and wellism uh, project management seed investments mentorship entrepreneurship leadership speaker and tech evangelism a person of utmost optimism who strives for constant innovation in the world of business transformation digital adoption and artificial intelligence with this uh, rich niche experience of transforming business ideas to technology driven business models his entire focus is on evangelizing uh, digital transformation with the power of ai ml and rpa mr sapnil as i told you are the thank last you. speaker so your responsibility is much more over right. to you right. over to you thank you so i would just need a control on my presentation yes thank you i got that and just let me know if my presentation is visible yes absolutely yes fine thank you so i think uh, good evening to everyone and uh, everyone here who is there the speakers have talked a lot of things that what are the best approaches like while we all heard everyone from the education industries the government bodies and the experts talking about that how many different initiatives you guys are taking in terms of uh, launching a lot of good things which students can benefit and be part of the Atmanibhar Bharat. So uh, let me just bring the perspective on how AI can help uh, the initiatives in the education and government and making the Atmanibhar Bharat as one of the major agenda for all of us. So while artificial intelligence is widely recognized as having the potential to transform the higher education, there are still questions about how will it work? How will the institutions adopt? How will the students adopt? And there are many things which continue to happen differently when these kind of questions come. So, well, here, let me tell you, like for all the wonderful initiatives you are talking about, you're taking up and launching, it is very important. It is very, very important that a few factors, when I look at from my perspective, are very, very important. The one is reach. Are we reaching to the right set of an audience at the right point of time? Are we engaging them? And I'll tell you a little more about the engagement because that is going to change the world around us. And the third is an instant support. I mean, you have what we have seen in the institutions uh, and the education is like you in the admission season get approximately 50,000, one leg or two leg of students getting inquiries done. But are you reaching out to them instantaneously? I mean, that's the biggest problem. Even the schemes what are getting launched, the initiatives, the hackathons, and everything which gets launched, there are a huge amount of questions which is students and the participants has. Are we answering them immediately? And that is what completely the game changes. So what important, what is important task for the universities or institutions today? Like instant support and the most critical activities when it comes to covering uh, the wide questions era and permutations combination. I mean, here, what I thought today while we were having this all discussion, I thought here are the two secrets which I wanted to give you on the success of all the initiatives which are doing. How can they be successful? And these two initiatives are very, very important, which can be seen as conversational AI. Uh, I hope you all can see my screen, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it is conversational AI and omnichannel orchestration. So the two things I'll give a very quick brief, like conversation is important for students or parents for engagement. And the moment it is a better engagement, that is a better possibility of conversions. So conversional AI is something which is a newly developed strategy. So if conversational AI improves students' engagement by allowing students to ask exactly what they need from you or your institution or your services, I mean, the initiatives, what you're doing here, and what more with the help of NLP, it's not just one way conversation, it becomes two way, three way conversations and help addressing queries instantaneously and provide recommendations too. Where are we doing today? When we 
ask about reaching out to the students predominantly we send sms we send email but where we where are the students today and not only students we all we all are today the world's biggest platform whatsapp with around 20 or for minutes what we are spending there on the regular basis like average open rate is more than 70 percent which is none of the platforms where it doesn't so if this is what the platform this is where majority of the universities have started moving up and shown started moving in india as well i mean few of them you can see on my screen right now we have alliance university Manglaitan university Rungta group of institutions and many other those who are just moving towards the next level of the uh, ai based ai powered conversation ai and messengers the whole objective is let's now rethink the philosophy what you reach out to these friends so rethink the engagement with the uh, omni channel orchestration so when it comes to the omni channel orchestration we talk about like you do email marketing but are this entire email marketing connected to your whatsapp where you can connect your students and also uh, do a AI powered instantaneous reply. The same goes with uh, SMS marketing, the same goes with your paid marketing, print marketing, holdings, banners, and whatever form of conversation you're doing. So the centralized unified real time engagement is something which is gonna change the, and the modern way of reaching out to these students and engaging with them. What have we have spoken about? So what I'm gonna do is, we all have spoken today a lot, let us show you the AI in experience and let's experience it. How does the AI in the WhatsApp industry work? Uh, over to my partner, Sujit. He is going to quickly share you the, his screen and show you the live example here. Can you pass on the, the screen to Sujit? Yes, uh, Anu? Yeah. The control is given to Sujit. Sujit, please present. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Sujit, we can see. Uh, uh, you're on mute. Yeah. Sujit, your screen is there, but you're on mute. Please speak. I think uh, uh, we are unable to listen to him. Uh, so, Swapnil, uh, if you can uh, elaborate on that. Right. Uh, so, no worries. Sujit will just continue on the screen. Screen we can see. So, Sujit, I can talk. Uh, so, if you see here, what is happening? The, every one of us is today on the Facebook. Every one of us are on the Insta, and that's the first place where we start interacting or promoting our uh, products or the services and the initiatives. So think about one example that one of the institution who have engineering as one of the courses to be promoted, he or they actually have put up the advertisement in the Facebook. Today, we all know the typical way it reaches out to our inquiry form and from there people fill up the information. But let's see how the conversational AI will change the world around us and how every institution becomes instantaneous. The moment I clicked on the send mass message button, immediately I have just got connected with that particular institute or uh, government body or maybe the business on the WhatsApp. And the entire conversation is started. Now I can just go ahead and ask, okay, I'm interested in BTEC, I'm interested to apply for admission. The moment I put up the information, there is an information coming up. Okay, we provide the following specialization. Probably what would you like to know? So you'll see the information coming down there. The beauty here is none of the human is replying at the back end. It is all self-driven and this bots and this, in, uh, this conversational AI can take place with less of these students inquiring at the same time as well. So even if, uh, even if you have an initiative, even if you have an, I was talking, uh, listening to sir that you have hackathons, there are legs and legs people, those who come and thousands of people wanted to have a queries and a clarifications. They can just have this kind of reports integrated with the AI and automated response uh, coming up. The next big thing is, if I wanted to send the information over the WhatsApp automatically after 10 days that, hey, uh, you have inquired with us, what do you want to know next? 
automatically this is known as drip campaigns over the WhatsApp. And this is something which I'm talking about, the very, very latest technology, which is not, I mean, only 10% or the 7% technology world knows about this kind of technology which is coming up. And I'm proud to be launching that in India because I'm from India, so I have been working in this industry for long, and it happens that I got a chance to develop and work on this and prepared it in the India market, and I became a startup again, back myself, or four months back. And coincidentally, the moment COVID happened, it just became a benefit for me left right center. I mean, that's how certain startups grow in the odd situations. And today we have almost 25 odd customers in the last three months, those who have adopted this kind of technology and reaching out to the masses and the globe has become a, a market for them so no restrictions because we all know how does this technology work it is like on whatsapp and across the globe everyone has it so that's how the entire ai is changing the way around us so i we thought why not to give you the experience of it right here and that's what from my side energy thank you so much <laughs> thank you so much mr sapnil i think we are running out of time so yeah. i would uh, directly uh, i would directly invite uh, dr preeti chitkara uh, manager uh, ia kite group of institution madam uh, uh, dr Ch preeti chitkara has more than 14 years of experience in the field of education and at uh, kite group of institutions she looks into communications branding event management and international relations uh, experienced professor with a demonstrated history of working in the higher education industry she is skilled in teaching english as a foreign language communication skills and creative and academic writing her research paper and articles have been published in uh, numerous national and international journals uh, anthologies magazines and books her blog are quite popular among the readers so madam uh, i am going to give you a toughest job to summarize the program to conclude the program and uh, the vote of thanks so over to you unmute yourself yeah. Yeah. Unmute yourself. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yeah. perfect. Now you are audible. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Neeraj, sir. Uh, Honorable Chief Guest, Professor K.K. Agarwalji, Chairman Nash, National Board of Accreditation, our most valued invited panelists, ladies and gentlemen. It's my privilege to have been asked to propose a word of thanks on this occasion. I, on behalf of SHM, National Council on Education and KIET group of institutions. Let me call it the Fraternity of Educationists. And on my own behalf, extend a very hearty word of thanks to all the speakers for gracing the webinar on At Nirbhar Bharat, role of higher education institution. Education is one of the focal areas of At Nirbhar Bharat. And as we all are aware, the vision of our Honorable Prime Minister Modi ji for a self-reliant India can be achieved through collaborations and partnerships among higher education institutions, industries, government, and society. Thereby, I believe that this topic has been most appropriate and is the need of the hour as it brought the expertise and experience of the panelists to the table. And I offer my heartfelt gratitude to all of them for engaging the audience in such fruitful, constructive, and open exchanges through this webinar. A big thank you to Professor K.K. Agarwalji for his views towards the role of higher education institutions, making our nation self-reliant, that is, at nirbhar I must mention a deep, of, deep sense of appreciation for his explanation of what is at nirbhar It doesn't mean we need to work alone. In fact, it means we should be able to take up our responsibility by our own and wherever need be, we should be interdependent, supporting and complementing each other. There has been a lot to take, sir. You have been truly inspirational, and I believe your stories would be certainly left would have certainly left a mark on the hearts and minds of the listeners. I'm extremely grateful to Dr. Abhay Jereji for his analysis of being at Nirbhar. According to him, it's not just providing products to Bharat. In fact, Indians have to start producing for the world. And for that, we need to focus on experiential learning and entrepreneurship and directing our students, our youngsters, into positive, constructive ideas. Your suggestion on shifting the mindset of the society may really work miraculously, and it is truly appreciated, sir. Thank you for that. 
I also express my gratitude to Dr. G.D. Sharmaji for enlightening us on the key roles and key areas of higher education institutions and sharing the action plans for teachers and organizations how to enhance their capability to become self-reliant and thus contribute in the making of Aatmanirbhar Bharat. We are really thankful to you, G.D. Sharma, sir, for your kind words and your precious words. I express our sincere thanks to Dr. Anita Gupta for giving an excellent coverage to the cultivation of the culture of innovation and entrepreneurship in higher education institutions. Ma'am, we appreciate your inspirational guidance of building Atma Vishwas and empowering one and all by promoting innovation in education. Thank you, ma'am, for your time and golden words. Now I, I would acknowledge our gratitude to, Dr. to Mr. Raghav Gupta for exposing his theory on how universities across the world have supported learning among the students during COVID-19 using Coursera for campus. Thank you, Raghav. Mr. My thanks to Mr. Swapnil Jain for sharing how the conversation AI through ORI can cater to the students' needs and the enormous cooperation in the organization of this event. Thank you, Swapnil. I now take this opportunity to extend my sincere thanks to the ones who are the main source of inspiration behind such webinars. Yes, the audience. We are euphorically enthralled to receive the enormous number of registrations that counted more than 2,400 from all streams across the country. I truly appreciate and thank the chancellors, vice chancellors, directors, consultants, promoters, industrialists, senior educationists, government officials, and related delegates from the fraternity, along with the students pursuing higher education who have joined us today. We thank each and every one in the audience for being with us this evening. It's been a great pleasure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, an event like this cannot happen overnight. The wheels start rolling weeks ago. It requires planning and a bird's eye for details. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of highly motivated and dedicated colleagues from SOCHAM, including Mr. Neeraj Arora, Mr. Deepak Chabra, and the IT professionals who are exceptionally result-oriented. I cannot thank them enough for their involvement and their willingness to take this on the completion of the task beyond their comfort zones. My th earnest thanks to all of them. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to place on record our hearty acknowledgements to the director, KIET Group of Institutions, Dr. A. Gard, and all my colleagues from KIET for their guidance and support in the organization of this event. To squeeze it into a few words, I would say, Lagan ho dil mein agar manzil paane ki, to asma bhi chukkar salam karta hai, so it's up to us to transform this difficult time into opportunity. My sincere thanks to one and all who were involved directly or indirectly in organizing the event. Take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Preeti. Thank you, Dr. So making the concluding remarks and vote of thanks so live. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Wonderful to hear thank from you, you the vote of thanks. Thank you. So, thank you, Neeraj, uh, and all the people for doing your excellent work. Uh, yeah, with your permission, uh, we should, uh, when we are calling it officially close. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Neeraj. Thank, thank you, Neeraj. Thank, 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 thank you, all the panelists. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, Swapnil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.